So Proverbs chapter 9, we know Proverbs chapter 8 is um, wisdom personified, which we find in the person of Christ. We find through the word of God is wisdom. Amen. Then in chapter 9, we see that this wisdom is contained within the church. It's contained within the church. And I I don't have the time to break it all down. uh, But chapter 9 starts off with verse 1 saying, Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. Amen. So we know that according to 1 Timothy 3.15, that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. Amen. Now, I've heard it said a whole lot that people uh, believe these seven pillars uh, is the perfection of the universal church as seen through the seven churches of Revelation, making up their eras of the universal church. And we know better than that. We know it's seven literal churches. I don't think the seven pillars here have anything to do with those seven churches in Revelation. Amen. I mean, they do uh, indirectly, but not directly. I believe what this has to do with is the Holy Spirit of God. We first see the Spirit of God uh, in a physical manifestation on the temple and on the tabernacle when it was a fiery pillar by night and a cloudy pillar by day. Amen. And I believe this is a picture of the Holy Ghost of God. And you say, well, what do you mean by seven pillars? I'm so glad you asked that. Let's jump over to Revelation 1 now. And let's look at a number, let's look at a um, phrase that is unique to Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. I'll just read verse 4. It says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia... Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now, a lot of people say, see, that's tied to the churches. Okay, we'll keep reading and you'll see it's not. It has to do with the person of Christ and the Holy Spirit of God. The next time we see this is in chapter 3 and verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. So there it is again, the seven spirits of God. In chapter 4 and verse 5, we see, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Again, and then one more time we see this phrase is in chapter 5 and verse 6. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now, I've taught on this when we went through Revelation. Basically, in chapter 1 and verse 4, the context seems to be the universality of the Holy Spirit in relationship, uh, in relation to the Trinity. Amen. Uh, In other words, all men can worship God because of the Spirit of God. We're going to learn about that here this afternoon. Without the Spirit of God, we cannot worship God. Amen. Uh, In chapter 3 and verse 1, we see... Uh, the Holy Spirit in relation to the churches. Amen, no doubt about that. Uh, In chapter 5 and verse 6, we see the Holy Spirit in relation to the lost world. It goes out into all the world. Amen. In chapter 4 and verse 5, we see the Holy Spirit in relation to the throne of God. And of course, that takes us back to Romans chapter 8 where we were talking this morning about glory and all these things, which I can't really get into. But I don't believe for a minute that those seven pillars in, in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 1, are the seven churches of Revelation. I believe it's the seven spirits of God. Amen. Anyway, a lot of things kind of grab your attention when you open the book of Revelation. A lot of sevens. Amen. Seven stars, seven angels, seven lamps. Uh, the lamb had seven horns, seven eyes, all these things that we read. 
But <clears throat> what stands out to me is the seven spirits of God, at least for our purposes today. Amen. Uh, now, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called, and one <laughs> hope of your calling. Wait a minute, is there a contradiction here? There's one spirit in, the, in this body, this temple uh, called the church. There's one spirit. But, so what does this seven spirits of God mean? Is there a contradiction? No, it's not. Um, in, in Revelation 1 and verse 10, John said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He didn't say anything about seven spirits. Amen. He said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. In Revelation 2, 7, it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. But you know what's interesting? He said that a total of seven times. If you have an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In Revelation eleven eleven, it says, After three days and a half, the Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet. Revelation twenty two seventeen 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. So how? What, what's the seven spirits? Right? Well, it is symbolism, which is backed up with the Word of God. The seven spirits of God. And it's talking about Christ. You remember he had seven eyes. Does Christ walk around with seven eyes and seven horns? No, no, this is symbolism, amen? Symbolism, and those seven eyes are the seven spirits of God. So I wanna show you uh, why there's seven. Why seven spirits, not just the one, amen? Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> let me point out that the word of God, when, when it uses sevens, and we'll see this a little bit later, it usually means complete, thorough, completion of something. So this seven spirits is showing us the completion of the Holy Spirit of God. And by the way, it's not just what we have here in our church. It also uh, applies to the world. Amen. We talk about the spirit being in our church all the time. But now what we're going to talk about is the spirit not only in our church, but concerning the world and what the world better do concerning the Spirit of God. Amen? So anyway, uh, I believe seven here is completeness and so on. And so the first reason I believe there's seven spirits here is to show us His comprehension or His perception. Or you could say the comprehension of His perception. In other words, nothing slips His notice. So there in Revelation 5 and verse 6, I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Amen. He comprehends everything. If you turn with me over to 1 Corinthians, keep your hand in Revelation. We'll probably go back. But 1 Corinthians chapter 3, which describes for us the the house of God is the church and the spirit uh, is in his temple, the church. Amen. But I want you to notice verses 19 and 20, where it says, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, now watch this, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. You see what I'm trying to point out here? God knows the thoughts of every human being. He knew the thoughts before he created anything. That's how all powerful. And what I'm trying to tell you is that he is all seeing. And when you look in Revelation, you'll find that Christ and the Holy Spirit are absolutely inseparable. They're the same person. They're, they're different yet one, amen? And we'll be able to see that when Christ comes back and, and I'll say, see, that's what we've been trying to say. No, I'll be learning it too, amen? Um, but, but Christ and the Holy Spirit are inseparable. I mean, think about this. Colossians 2.9 says, For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Right. 
When you see Jesus Christ, you know, Jesus told uh, Philip uh, there in John 14, he says, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. You want to know what God looks like? You're looking at him. Amen. John 3, 34 says, for he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. What I'm trying to tell you is that Jesus Christ sees everything everywhere. Amen. He's not just some person that was a martyr and he's kind of propped up as an idol. No, my friends, he's the creator, the God of all the universe. And whether you like it or not, whether you've made him your Lord or not, he's still your Lord. He's still your God. He's still your creator. And he sees everything that you do. He knows every thought. Proverbs 15, 3 says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. Hebrews 4.13 says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. 1 Samuel 16.7 says, The Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Psalm 44.21, He knoweth the secrets of the heart. Psalm 90 and verse 8, Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. We think we're getting by on God. We think we can just mock God. The world thinks that they can just, just throw God behind their back and there's not going to be any repercussions. He sees every bit of it and the judgment is, is, about, is about to happen. Amen? So I believe that there's seven spirits here that, that is teaching us the comprehension of his perception. Nothing escapes by Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. So you kind of follow me, seeing what it, I don't think this is too difficult of a subject. All right, now this is where it could get a little sticky, but I've got Bible to back it up. I don't have to make up a, uh, an opinion on this, okay? I believe also that the seven spirits are, of God are not only teaching us the comprehension of his perception, but the character of his person, the character of Jesus Christ, the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits. Remember, the spirit in Christ, they, can, they are inseparable. There's something about the sevenfold spirit and Christ's character, all right? So, and by the way, what are we supposed to get? when we get saved, Christ's character. Right. Amen. So this is going to apply to us as well. So let me read this to you, or you can go with me to Matthew chapter three. Uh, very, very, uh, um, not only important, but uh, well-known verses around here. We, we put great stock into the fact that Jesus was baptized. Amen. But in, in Matthew chapter three, verses 16 and 17, it says, and Jesus when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You know, when you stand at that event, and you see the Son of God come up out of the water and the Spirit of God light upon Him and then the voice of the Father of God substantiate who He is and identify with Him, you got to walk away with that with one answer and that is this. He's somebody special. He has a different character than everyone else. Amen? Now, okay, still keep your hand in Revelation. We'll probably go back to it, but... Now turn with me to Isaiah 11. You'll find that when you read the book of Isaiah, man, it's almost like God had the New Testament in view when He wrote that. He sure did. In Isaiah 11, let me show you something really neat. And I want to look at verses just 1 and 2. He says, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Who, who is that? It's Christ. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. Uh, that capital B there, that's a person. That's Christ. Amen. Now watch. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Okay. The spirit of wisdom 
and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. How many listed spirits do you see there? I see seven. Now, here's what helps me comprehend this, okay? What helps me understand this. If y'all remember back in our tabernacle teachings, we talked about one of these, a menorah. This is the candlestick. It's got seven candlesticks within one. When you feel the oil up in this thing, you just pour it in the middle here. And as it feels, all of them feel the exact same time. Isn't that really cool? Um, <clears throat> so the purpose of the menorah or the candlestick was to shine light onto the table, which had the 12 pieces of bread. It had the, the, the gold crown around it. And what a picture of Christ's kingdom and Melchizedek and his table and all those things that we discussed. But this is a picture of Christ um, as the prophet, okay? When you walk in to the tabernacle, there on your right would have been that table. That's the kingdom. There he is, Christ the king. Straight ahead of you would have been the altar of incense. Who offers up incense? Priests. Christ the priest, his three offices. And here is that shines light on all of it is Christ the prophet. And, and you say, but Brother Sam, how does this affect me today? I'll tell you how. Because this right here that I hold in my hand that I preach from is the light that shines on Christ. Right. This is it. This is him. And it makes a difference in our life as the Spirit of God intertwines with the Word of God and makes us a different person, makes us have the character of Christ. In uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, we learned about the Spirit that would be on Christ that would identify His character. And I want you to know this main stem of the menorah here, Spirit of the Lord. Here we go. And then, as we get going... Uh, that spirit of the Lord is the main shaft uh, and, and is showing that, his, that Christ's uh, spiritual ca character blossoms out from himself. He, he didn't learn character. He is character. Amen. And it's all because he is God. All right. Now, let's kind of apply this not only to Christ and the seven spirits, but let's also apply it to us because we're supposed to have the character of Christ. Amen. Watch this. First, they said, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Here we go. As you start to fill it up, the, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, that is what I would call the uh, condition of our standing. If we did not have the wisdom of Christ through salvation and the understanding of our need for repentance and all this, it's given to us by the spirit, we would not have a standing in God. Our salvation is all of the Spirit. And as we get what our salvation gives us, everything else fills up with it. There's no such thing as a person that is, that, that, that is truly saved and does not get all of the character points that Christ gave all seven spirits. There's no one that has that. Because when you get born again and your vessel gets the Spirit of God, you get all seven spirits, Amen. so to speak. Right. You understand? This whole idea of, well, I'm saved, but I don't need to uh, read the Bible. That, is, that doesn't even exist. It's seven spirits here because it shows the completeness of His character or the character of His person. This is the condition of our standing. Listen to what Proverbs 2, 6 says. Remember, we're talking about the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Listen to this. For the Lord giveth wisdom. I, I didn't get it just because I learned about God has to give it. The Lord giveth wisdom. Out of His mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. It's the Spirit of God is the only reason you and I have knowledge and understanding of the and, and uh, wisdom and understanding of the things of God. And it's all because of salvation in the person of Christ. Are you trying to see, are you seeing what I'm trying to convey now? Amen. Let's move on. 
Uh, so the wisdom and understanding is, is the condition of our standing, but then also of counsel and of might. Counsel and of might. Um, that's the confidence of our standing. Amen? That we stand for Christ and we don't just stand out there like, you know, like a, a, a leaf that's about to get blown off of a tree. We stand out there on the rock, on the word of God, amen? We believe in thus saith the Lord. That's what changes our character. That is the confidence of our standing. Proverbs 8, 14 says, counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding, I have strength. He's talking about the word of God. That's our strength. When we got saved, Christ gave us his character because this is his character. The two more, and I I think it's interesting that they're linked together like that. Isn't that interesting? A whole lot more study. But thirdly, we've seen the condition of our standing is wisdom and understanding. The confidence of our standing is counsel and might. But thirdly, let me point out the continuation of our standing. There's no such thing as here today, gone tomorrow, Christianity. There's no such thing. Amen. I know we go through rough times. There's, you'll even see in Martyr's Mirror, there are people that denied him to avoid death and then came back and turned themselves in because they repented. Amen. We can all fail. We can all fall. Amen. Isn't that right? Um, anyway, knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Okay. Knowledge and the fear of the Lord. You were talking about our confidence is in the fear of God. Proverbs 9 and verse 10 says, and when those, oh, I'm sorry, I looked at the wrong thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Is understanding. Is understanding. Who gives us the spirit of the Lord? Who gives us wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and the fear of the Lord? Christ does. Amen. Christ does. Because that's who he is. That is probably the greatest picture that I've ever brought in my mind of what the seven spirits of God are. Amen? That, does that help you understand the verse a little better? It does for me too. And I, I'm not sure I'm even right. Uh, uh, I think I am. I, I got enough Bible behind me. I, I'm hoping. But anyway, let, let's get back to this. Why seven spirits? Well, first of all, it's the comprehension of his perception. There's not one thing that gets by Christ. Amen. Not one thought. The second thing is the character of his person. And you say, now, why is that important that Christ's character is so clean, so pure? And I'm going to tell you why. It's because you need to look at his character and realize that as a sinner, you do not add up. You do not achieve Christianity by trying to be Christ-like. You cannot do it in and of yourself. It takes the, the Spirit of God, the sevenfold Spirit of God, to change your life given through repentance and faith. That He has to come to you. He knows you're a sinner. He knows more about your sin than you do. He knows how messed up you are even more than you do. He knows how corrupt you are even more than you do. And then He's also saying, now look at here, pal. Here's the standard. Look at me. If you don't meet that standard, you're in trouble. A third thing that this seven spirits shows us about Christ is the completeness of his purging, the completeness of his purging. Jacob bowed seven times. The priest sprinkled the blood seven times. Lepers were sprinkled seven times. Jericho marched around seven times for seventh day. On the seventh day, it was uh, seven times. Naaman washed in the Jordan uh, River seven times. The word of God is purified seven times. So can you see that there is a idea of completeness, uh, thoroughness, amen? Anyway, in Matthew chapter three, uh, I should have kept us there, but Matthew chapter three, and I wanna read verses 11 and 12. This is talking about Jesus Christ. And boy, you better pay attention. And in in verse 11, it says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. 
He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in his hand and he will throughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. See what I'm trying to tell you, here's my message this morning in the book of Revelation is that when it talks about the seven spirits of God, it's describing the fullness of the spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen. And it's talking about the comprehension of his perception. He knows who you are and how messed up you are. It's talking about the character of his person. He's the standard of which you cannot obtain. Amen. And then it talks about the completeness of his purging. If something doesn't happen from God to change your life and your situation and being held by sin, I want to tell you, you're going to be burned alive for eternity eternity completely thoroughly seven times over in destruction yeah. for all eternity yeah. he will completely let me first say this he will completely purge his people now there's a couple ways that the bible presents christ's people one is all the saved and he does purge us doesn't he amen through chastening and things like that he purges us. Uh, uh, he, will, he will lead in a sermon and, and it'll be preached and boy, Christ will start sowing some seeds of repentance in your heart and here you go. He'll purge you. Amen. He'll change your life around. But also, let me point out, His people is His church or churches, we should say. His churches, of uh, one of which we have here. We are His people. Now, can we honestly say since this church has been formed, that every person that was a member of this church was saved. It, whether they are or not, we can't truly say that because Jesus didn't even have that. You understand? He, he didn't have that. But Judas was purged, was he not? Amen. So what we're going to have to understand is that he will purge his church. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This, what cracks me up about people reading 1 Corinthians 3 is they try to make their body the temple of God here when the Bible is clearly showing it's the church yeah. is the temple of God. So l l let's take a look at this. 1 Corinthians 3 beginning in verse 9. For we are laborers together with God Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. So who is he talking to here? Church. The church at Corinth. Okay. He's not, he didn't even say except y'all that aren't saved or nothing like that. He said the church is the building of God. You're his temple. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So you see the expectation there of people in church are to be saved, even though that's not always the truth. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now that's pretty clear, isn't it? Christ will purge his people. Ephesians 5.27 tells us that he might present the church, okay, by the context, to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. How's he going to do that? He's going to purge his church. Right. What I'm trying to tell you, one of the greatest offenses on planet earth is not necessarily the reprobate, not necessarily the drunk, the sinner, the, uh, the, um, the one that thumbs his nose at God, but one of the biggest problems 
is the people that are in the kingdom of God that are lost or that claim to be in the kingdom of God and are lost. When you read about Christ purging, especially in Matthew 13's parables, he's talking about his kingdom. That is, a, that is a huge offense that people would come in through the door of a testimony, which is not in their heart, but on their lips. And then they would uh, get baptized and they would learn a testimony and how to act and enjoy the church and all these things they do, probably cause a million problems while they're there. Then they think that they're okay. That is a huge offense to God. And he knows every person because of the comprehension of his perception. He knows every person that does not have the character of his person and he will truly purge you out of the kingdom of God. Matthew 13, 30. Y'all remember the tares and the um, parable of the wheat and the tares. He says the kingdom of God is likened to. He wasn't talking about the world. He said the kingdom. And then somebody said, well, wait a minute. Uh, The wicked one has sown tares among the wheat. Should we go out there and pull them up? This is what Jesus said. Let both grow together until the harvest. And then the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers. Boy, I thought we covered this so well week before last, man. The last day reaping. But anyway, I just had to throw that in there. But he'll say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is going to purge all those that call themselves churches. He goes on in Matthew 13, 41. He says, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. These are lost people who are trying to act saved. So here's the point. I thank God I'm saved. Amen. And I thank God that any character I have that's Christ-like, it's because He gave it to me. He worked it out in me. It's not me, okay? Um, And I thank God that I am kept by Him, by His power. He does it. You know, there's times I've done some stupid things and and I've done some things that, oh, thank God, it's by the blood or I would have lost my salvation. (laughs) But God was he's so good and I'm saved. But listen to 1 Peter where he says this. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin with us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? If Christ is going to be so harsh on his churches, on judgment day. Well, what's it going to be like for the person that doesn't even know Christ? And he goes on and says, and if the righteous scarcely be saved. He's talking about his churches. He's saying these are the righteous. You look around planet earth, you should be able to see righteous people at such and such Baptist church. And they try to live righteous. That's what we call it, the righteous. Amen? Amen. And if they scarcely be saved, in other words, if there's not really too many of them that are really saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Do you see my point this morning? Somebody will see the title of this message. They'll blow right by it. I don't care anything about it. They better listen to it. They better understand that Jesus Christ is complete. He's full in His comprehension, in His perception, in His person, in His purging. And I want to tell you, anybody that doesn't know Him is going to hell. So why seven? show you that he sees it all he is it all and he's going to take care of it all that's why it's seven spirits amen that's pretty powerful stuff that helps me understand the book of revelation even a little better amen i'm sorry i had you hold your hand there and never took you back (laughs) want me to read a verse just to make you feel better (laughs) amen all right god bless you today thank you so much church for paying attention and your prayers and so on god bless you